Hi, it's Miss Lisa from the St. Paris Public Library. Welcome back to night number three of our chapter book reading, Just Before Bed, Of a Feather. Let's get started. Chapter 12, Rufus. It's only when they close the web over the opening of his new cave that I realize the furless creatures are not staying here with me, that I am alone in the wild darkness with a very large and huffy hawk less than a swoop from where I perch. I consider hooting for help, but who in the whole of the wide world would help a great horned owl? So, you the, so you're the new bird. It's the hawk. I freeze, flip up my ear tufts, blend in. If you're trying to hide from me, it's not going to work. You're in an enclosed nest, a small version of what my partner lives in. I'm in the nest next to you. Nest? Meaning, I can't eat you, even if I wanted to, which I don't. She's thought about eating me? The memory of the stabbing pain of the goosehawk's talons through my wing nearly causes me to drop off my perch. Not the brightest bird in the roost, are you? You're safe from me and everything else. Stop trembling like a chick. It is much of a, won it is much of a wonder that owls hate hawks. Look, owl. We're the only two birds around, and I haven't had anyone to squawk with in more than a season, so get hooting. Was it an owl, I asked? What was that? Her talons scratched across her perch. She hadn't expected a response. No, she grumbles. It was a go ghost hawk that thought he was above talking to a lowly red tail. Just the word ghost hawk sends trembles through my feathers. I do not like ghost hawks. No bird likes ghost hawks. Her chirp is muffled. She must be preening. Then again, no bird likes a great horned owl either. That just gets me muffled, fluffed. You know, not all great horned owls are bad. All great horned owls are large, silent predators that kill you in your sleep and eat basically everything in the forest that isn't a moose so no, maybe not bad, but certainly not something to be liked. I bob my head, considering. You do have a point, I hooted. Of course I have a point. I don't bother screeching if I don't have a point. This hawk is the oddest combination of desperate and standoffish. Not that I have much experience with hawks. This is the first one I've ever squawked with, who is not also trying to kill and eat me. Why are you here, I dare to ask. What are those enclosed nests, and what do the furless creatures want with us? The hawk rouses her feathers. Furless creatures? You mean my partner? We hunt food together. She chases rabbits and squirrels from the bushes, and I swoop down from the trees and kill and eat them. It's quite fun. Hunt together? That was my idea. Are you saying that the furless creatures hunt in packs like hawks? Do you think they'd teach me to hunt with them? Teach you, the hawk practically wakes the forest with that screech. First of all, no self-respecting hawk hunts in packs like a fur-brained coyote. My partner is a useful assistant on the hunt. But more importantly, are you hooting that you don't know how to hunt? Now I'm fluffed again, and just when I had my face feathers in perfect hearing order, pellets. I must calm down, breathe in through the beak, let the cool air calm my gizzard. Once my feathers are back in their place, places and my ear tufts are straight, I chirp back at her. I've caught a vole. Once. Once? Yes, I say, and it was quite a wonderful kill if I do say so myself. You've caught one vole. Yes, I repeat a little louder. I'm beginning to wonder if the hawk is deaf. Only one vole, and you're, what, nearly six moons old? I tap out the moons with my talons. Great beak. It has been nearly a full six months. Six moons. My mother, I begin but can't finish. The hoots catch in my beak like ants in sap. Oh, you poor thing. The hawk's tone has changed like a summer evening. The storm has passed, and now it's warm and wet and starry, and the crickets are chirping. Was it another bird, she tweets. She understands. It was a monster, one of the monsters the furless creatures used to roll around the forest. Oh, you poor little fledgling, the hawk screeches. You didn't see it, did you? 
I saw everything I peep. Did she hoot at you afterwards? Her tweet is flat. She told me to fly away. I didn't. I tried to follow the monster. The human took her. Now her chirp is brighter. Her heart beat faster. The furless creature. You call them humans? The human took her. It threw a skin over her and picked her up like a piece of prey and put her inside the monster. Oh, again, the screech sends the whole forest squawking and rustling. What news? That's the best thing that could have happened. The hawk is flapping around her nest, shrieking with joy. The human probably brought her someplace like here. Sometimes my partner takes a bird that has been hit by those growling, shiny monstrosities and helps it get better. When it's healed, she lets it go back into the sky. I run my beak over my hurt wing. It feels better. No stinging, no burning. It's even less stiff. The furless creatures made me better. Could it be that somewhere a furless creature is helping mother get better, too? Do you really think so? I can barely let myself dream that it's true. I do, the hawk says, stamping her talons. And when you're better, they'll send you out to find her, hopefully after they teach you to hunt. You can call me Red. Bye. Bye. Bye and bye. At first, hearing those chirps, I'm ready to fly off this very heartbeat. But when somewhere out in the night, the yip of a fox echoes, and I'm reminded of all the terrible things outside these walls that are waiting for me a meal to fly into their snouts, a helpless, hopeless owl of a meal, an owl who's only ever caught one vole in his whole stupid short life. Don't give fluffed owl, red twitters. I'll help you learn how to hunt. My partner will help too. I'm sure of it. We won't send you out to starve and be eaten by a bumble-footed goshawk. Relief like smooth fur down my gullet calms my feathers. You really don't like goshawks? Red clacks her beak. No one likes goshawks. Great big feather for brains bullies. She grumbles softly to herself for a few more heartbeats, and then I hear her snuffling in her sleep. The furless creatures are here to help birds. They help birds get better and then let them fly free. And Red's going to teach me to hunt. I'll catch a vole. No, two voles. No, three voles and a mouse and scarf them all down. And then I'll be set free to find mother and first and father. They'll be waiting for me in the branches, wings wide. We'll fly together through the velvet night and hoot as loudly as we want. Hoot, 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 hoot. Gizzards and crops, Red Squawk. Red squawks, sounding completely fluffed. Please, owl, do keep it down for us day birds. Sorry, Red. Blasted owl, she grumbles, hooting all night, waking me from my nicest dream. Here, squirrely, I see your fluffy tail wiggling. I twitter softly to myself, just imagining her crouched on her perch, ready to pounce on her dream squirrel. That's going to be me, I hoot to myself. I'm going to learn how to hunt. I'm going to be I'm going to fly free. I find a comfortable perch in this warm and safe nest and listen to the world of the night. My world, the world of the owl, chitter and snuffle and scrape and chirp all around me. Chapter 13, Reenie. Now a little farther from the perch, Beatrice commands. We're back inside the bird room and Rufus is hopping from the perch to my fist most of the time. This time, I'm apparently too far for him to bother with flying for the tidbit. He clasps and unclasps his talons, shifting around on the perch. He swivels his head to check out the rest of the room. I could move closer, I say. Maybe I'm pushing him too fast. It's Saturday, and we've both been working on this very minute, on this every minute. I haven't been in school. But still, Beatrice sighs. No, he's done, she says. But you got a few good hops in there. I think we can try him on the cre cre creance soon. The creance is a long string you tie to your bird's jesses so that he can fly to you from farther away without you having to worry that he's going to fly off entirely. It's also something you use you only use outside. We're going to fly him outside? The thought of flying Rufus through the sunset sky, of us soaring through the trees, curls my lips into a smile, but the buzz whispers, alone. Falconers lose, lose hawks outside, even on the creance, 
creance, Rufus could snag the string on a sharp edge and escape, or I could drop the creance and he'd be lost. We'll start by just walking him around outside. Beatrice takes off her work gloves. Then we'll see if he wants to fly. Panic skitters like spiders underneath my skin. But he could hurt his wing. Beatrice looks at him. He's not even favoring it anymore. I think he's ready. But what if she's wrong? What if his wing can't take the strain? What if he crashes and it gets worse? What if I ruin him? The buzz whispers. But it's only been a few days, I say. He's a young bird and he he's healing well, Beatrice says standing. He's got to get back in the air. She folds her arms across her chest. He has to stay wild, remember? He's not a pet. But what about manning him? I'm ready to scoop Rufus up and hide him in my sweatshirt. I do not want to think about letting him go. Not for months. Not until the spring. Not ever. Beatrice smiles. I'm not worried about manning this bird. I turned around and see that Rufus has hopped off of his perch and is pecking at the zipper on my hoodie, which dangles from my wrist. I roll onto my butt to get a better look, dragging the zipper across the floor, and Rufus hops after it, grabbing with his talons. A laugh burbles out from between my lips. The panic scatters. The buzz quiets. Is he playing? What do you think he's doing, Beatrice asks. I untie the sleeve of my hoodie so I can drag it farther to, and get Rufus to stretch his legs. My wood carving from recess on Friday flops out of my pocket. What's this, Beatrice asks, picking it up. The buzz whispers, dangerous. Do I tell her? Is it safe to share? I decide to just go for it. It's going to be an owl, I say, keeping my eyes on Rufus' silly dance. My friend, I mean this kid at school, Jackson, he whittles, but he can't bring a knife to school, so we're whittling with pens. That's why there's some blue smudges. I glance up, and Beatrice has a, this queer smile on her lips as she turns the wood over in her hands. Huh, she hands it back to me. I like it. There's a little release inside like air from a bag of chips. Me too, I say, looking at my owl. The other owl, the real one, has captured my zipper and is ripping its, his beak through the fabric around it. Rufus, no, I yelp and go to pull the sweatshirt back. Stop, Beatrice snaps. I freeze. There's that shiver of fear. The crackle of buzz. I've ruined it. She's had enough of me. But it fizzles away just as quickly. I get that the yelling is about Rufus. I understand that she's protecting us both. Never take prey from your bird, Beatrice. No. Aunt B instructs. She kneels down beside me. You're building trust here. He's not a dog. He's a predator. And you're his partner. He's caught some interesting prey. Now you have to make a switch. She hands me what looks like an old dog toy with the wings with the wings of a dead bird sticking into it. That's gross, I say. That's a lure, she says. See if he'll take it instead. I bend forward, sliding the lure across the floor. I push it right up to Rufus's talons. He's too busy shredding the hem of my sweatshirt. Aunt B jerks her hand and the lure jumps. It atta it's attached to a string. That got Rufus's attention. The tufts are up. She jerks it again. Rufus's ear tufts lie back. His eyes are glued on the lure. His wings droop down, a sign he's ready to fly. She jerks the lure again. Rufus is up and pounces on the lure. He screeches and flaps and tears with his talons and then with his beak. Get that sweatshirt out of here, Aunt B whispers. I sneak my shirt away and toss it out the door into the kitchen. Aunt B is still jerking and flapping the lure around, and Rufus is screeching and lumbering after it, wings wide in an attempt to look big and intimidating. I can tell Aunt B is trying not to laugh at him. We have the same smile burning across our faces. Rufus, though, is ob oblivious as he's completely focused on attacking the skittering lure. lure. Owls hunt with their ears, Aunt B says. We have to figure out how to make a lure that focuses, his, that focuses his hearing. The dog toy, I whisper. I creep around to where I found the basket of old dog toys. There are a bunch of thin, squeak, plastic, squeaky things, but I need something that can stand up to a talon. I find a thin rope toy with a tough-looking rubber ball attached to its middle. The ball has a bell buried inside it. Perfect. I crawl back and wave it. 
Aunt B stares at the toy for a second. Did she not know they were there? Then shrugs. Tie a string to it. I find some twine in the kitchen. I use one of my loop knots I practiced for the ball chitri ch trap. It's perfect. Aunt B has Rufus on the opposite side of the perch. I swing the rope toy slightly, giving off a faint jingle. Rufus's head inst instantly swivels. I've got two yellow eyes on me. No, not on me, on the toy. He screeches and flaps right over the perch, attacking the toy. Yes, hisses Aunt B. That's it. Did you see that? I whisper. Rufus is attacking the toy, pulling tufts of string from it. We should stop him before he gets to the bell. Oh, I say, how? She looks at me, eyebrows raised. She thinks I know the answer. Wait, do I know the answer? A tidbit. What's better than pretend food? Real food. And maybe after all this shredding, Rufus is hungry again. I pull a scrap of mouse from the pouch I have hooked on my jeans. Aunt B smiles. You've got it. Now flick it to the side. I flip it off my finger like a freshly picked booger, and Rufus instantly whips his head to follow its flight. His reflexes, he reflexes so fast, it's like he knew I would flick it. He flaps and pounces on the meat. Aunt B sneaks a hand lightly, lightning fast across the floor and grabs the toy, hiding it in a pocket of her cardigan. Rufus gulps the tidbit down, turns his eyes to me. Now get him on the fist, Aunt B says. I nod, stick a tidbit in my glove, whistle, shake my hand. He squawks and then hops up onto my fist. He gulps the tidbit down, then stands there, chirping and peeping and twisting his head in circles. Aunt B tips her head to us. That bird is manned. I manage to do all my reading for English class with Rufus sitting on my fist. Aunt B calls me for dinner and I hook Rufus back onto the leash and let him hop off my fist onto the perch. He squawks, then rouses, and begins to preen. He knows he's, he knows he's safe. He knows he's home. I hunch over my bowl and eat my soup. This isn't Rufus's home, though. At some point, after he's come to love this house, after he feels safe, he's going to get thrown back into the wild to fend for himself. I can't let that, I can't let him get soft. He can't forget where he came from. After dinner, instead of working with Rufus on my fist, like I'd planned, I put him back in the aviary. I sit at the kitchen table alone and finish my math homework while Aunt B reads in the living room. I haven't written to Mom since Monday. I've gotten two letters from her. She's on a new dose of her medication. She thinks it's helping already. I want to believe her. I want to trust that it's for good this time, but I want to do that every time. This golden light... The, this golden light floods through the windows and turns the whole house into a honeyest honeyscape. The numbers float on the page. I close my math book. Aunt B is flipping through her book, which I see now is actually a photo album. Are those pictures of your daughter, I ask, walking over to the couch? Aunt B smiles tightly. No, she says, moving over to let me sit beside her. These are pictures of my dog, Buckles. She turns the page and there's this scrawny, wire-haired little dog. He died a year ago. Used to help me in Red Hunt. Gulp. Are those his toys Rufus is destroying? Now I feel bad. She snuffles a little laugh. Yes, she says. But better he eats them than they get be left collecting dust in the corner. She runs her thumb along the edge of a picture of Buckles in the grass. Paws down, butt up, ready to chase something. Buckles would have wanted a raptor to have his toys. She flips slowly through the pages. There's an old picture with a girl who looks my age. She has stick straight blonde, white blonde hair and holds buckles like a baby in her arms. The daughter. That's Ava, Aunt B says, turning the page towards me. We adopted buckles together when her father and I first, when we divorced. He and his new wife decided to move to St. Louis a year later for some job. Ava went with them. She wanted to go, I asked because I can't imagine wanting to leave here. The judge, she stops. Sometimes you don't get to choose. I didn't choose to come here. I won't, it won't be my choice to leave either. Why, why would I ever want to leave this place? But then I feel mom like some ghost limb, a part of me that's been taken. I don't even have a picture of her. No one prints photos anymore. All I have of us is the marabou. 
and it's lost most of its fluff. Aunt B flips to the next page, buckles again, this time with red, red blurry in the sky behind him. Ava visited during the holidays and a few weeks in the summer, and we talked on the phone, but she's older now. She's in college, studying to be a nurse. Last time she emailed me, she mentioned a boyfriend she was thinking of moving in with after graduation. She stares at the picture like she's looking for Ava hovering in the shadows. Aunt B looks so sad, the buzz crackles dangerous. What if Aunt B's like mom? What if the sadness takes her too? I can't believe I got her talking about this. Typical me. I have to fix this. You should invite her back, I say. I could sleep in the bird room. Aunt B smiles, closes the book. Even if Ava did come back, she says, you'd sleep in your room. Why does hearing her call it that make me want to cry? Because it's not my room, not my house, not my homework, not my anything. And now I am going to cry. I am crying. Aunt B seems flustered. Oh, Maureen, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to upset you. I'm just, I'm not very good at people. She finds a box of tissues and hands it to me. My insides roll and twist and the buzz screams, dangerous, and I have to get away. I should check on Rufus, I say, wiping my face clean on my sleeve. Wait, Aunt B says, placing her hand on my arm. I sink into her touch back down onto the couch. I meant that about the room, she says. When they called me about taking you in, they said I had to be prepared for it being for good. I had to agree to that, and I want you to know that, because I meant it when I said it to the judge, and I mean it now. The buzz shivers along my skin. Dangerous. But it feels wrong. Aunt B is not mom. No matter what happens, you always have a place here. Okay, Maureen? She looks at me straight on, and in this way, most grown-ups don't even use with each other. That look melts the buzz away. I decide to try something different, to try trust. Okay, I say. Her lips curl into a small smile, and I know she knows that my whole soul has, that my whole soul has up and wrapped itself around her. Reenie, I say. What? Call me Reenie. She looks confused. It's my nickname, I explained. You can call me it, I added. I mean, if you want to. She snorts a little laugh. Reeny. She chews the name over. It suits you. That night, as I sleep, I listen to Rufus hooting like a one-owl rock band out in the night. I know what he's feeling. He's found a home. Chapter 14. Rufus. I hunted... I hoot to Red, who's pretending to be asleep in her nest. I heard the root tweeting, and I hunted it dead. Gah, owls, don't you ever sleep? Red squawks, snapping her wings and stomping her talons. That's not hunting, owl. That's practice. What are you talking about, I chirp. I heard the root, and I pounced. It was in shreds when I finished. It was a root, though, asked Red. Yes, I say, restating the obvious. Honestly, this bird listens to less than half of my hoots. I doubt it was an actual root, she says, chattering on. But regardless, if it wasn't prey, it wasn't hunting. It was practice to help you get into your instincts. Get into my instincts? No way, I squawk, flapping over to the rock perch to mute. The root tweeted, and I killed it dead. Fine, seeing as you're the expert hunter of the pair of us, she grumbles, I'm sure you're right. Now that's just rude. Owl, I sleep at night. Please shut your beak. <laughs> she roused her feathers, tromps around her perch, and is silent. Could she be right? Could my amazing feats of murder and destruction really only be practice? Of course it's just practice. Obviously only the worst owl, no, worst bird of prey in the whole forest, thinks hunting a squeaking root is the same as hunting a mouse. Mice are cunning. Mice have legs. Mice are sneaky on their tiny, sneaky feet. I have to practice on living things, but where am I going to find a living thing? Something small smacks into the wall of my nest. A buzzing thing. A bug. Yes. Perfect. I will hunt bugs. Now where is that bug? I lift my feathers, twist and turn them, 
sculpting, sculpting the sound the way my wings work the wind. The night around me takes shape. Far away, I hear the leaves of the forest trees rustling. Closer, the blades of grass slipping along the stalks of their neighbors. Heartbeats, hundreds of them, some close, some far, pound out pulses, making the once silent darkness a thrum of noise. It's too much. I can't hear anything but noise everywhere. The bug buzzes, flying off, its wing whipping whir, getting softer and softer. I failed. Again, I'll never hunt. I close my eyes, bury my head as deep as I can between my wings, muffling the great roar of noise, that deafening blast of information I have no idea how to pick apart. The first flicker of sunlight cracks across the stars, and somewhere outside my nest voices whisper, and then the furless creatures are walking alongside the web around my nest. The brown frizz is radiating energy, but the gray tail looks half asleep. They're chirping at each other, and then they slip, split the web. The brown frizz is wearing her paw with meat and chirping, so I flap down as, he beco- as has become our custom. The meat gets, sets my gizzard grumbling, and I decide that even the most pathetic owl, who couldn't hear a bug unless it was buzzing up his butt, deserves to eat every once in a while. The gray tail slips the little strips of skin into my leg sparkles, and the brown frizz dra- grabs onto them. I contemplate trying to fly off and tear those stinking skin strips right off my sparkles, but every time I attempt this feat, I end up in a bat hang, so I decided to give up that particular thought, at least for the moment. The brown frizz begins walking with me through the grass. Red was right. My enclosed nest does look a bit like a smaller breed of the one that the furless creatures sleep inside. The forest I listen to all night looks thick and dark and full of menacing creatures hungry for a bite of owl. Brown frizz, I squawk. I don't think I'm going to be a very good hunting partner. In fact, to be clear, I may never catch any prey that isn't a root. The brown frizz does not seem upset by my hoots. Rather, her beakless maw is twisted into what I've come to understand as a sign of good feelings. She growls something and then holds out some meat. All right, I say, I will eat your offering, but I want to be clear, I am not a hunter, and I will only, reli- I will only reliably kill roots. The brown frizz mumbles something that keeps making her good feelings face. Maybe she only wants to catch roots. No, that can't be it. The brown frizz could very well catch a root on her own. No, she must know something I don't, or she just trusts that I'm more than just a root catcher. Well, you are certainly not what I expected. I whip my head around and there's Red sitting on on old Graytail's featherless wing. She's quite a big hawk with a sleek head tapering to to a long, sharp hooked beak. Her red feathers seem to glow in the skinny shafts of sunlight. How's that? I ask, trying to ruffle up my dull tree bark bark brown feathers. I straighten up my ear tufts and fan my tail. She turns her head, examining the yard around us. I was expecting a half-plucked hatchling. You're a real bird. That gets my feathers fluffed. Half-plucked hatchling! She flaps her wings and flies to a stumpy tree sticking up in the yard. With the way you were grousing all night about never being able to hunt and getting eaten by a clutch of field mice, I thought to myself, no way a full-grown owl would dare to even dream of such a pathetic end. But I see I was wrong at, on at least one count. She gives me a long stare over her hooked beak. She heard me? That was a terrible nightmare. How could she have heard anything? Great beak. Was I hooting in my sleep? This is bad, even for the absolute worst great horned owl in all of owldom. It was just a dream, I chittered. I, I try to flap over to another one of the stumpy trees in the yard. It appears that the blighted corpses of several trees remain sticking up in the grass, but I hit the end of those blasted leg tails and end up hanging tufts down. That's more what I was expecting, Red chirps, her eyes bright. She thinks this is funny. Do not laugh at me, I screech, flapping and thrashing. The brown frizz hisses. Her paw reaches out. 
Distracted, I forget to thrash, and suddenly I'm upright. I grasp some clenched, paw, clenched paws beneath me. The brown frizz's heart skips along happily, and she makes her good feelings face. She helped me. Again, she always helps. She holds out a little scrap of meat. I gobble it down. She believes I can be a hunter, a hunter of more than roots, of mice and voles, of squirrels even. She believes in me. Maybe I need to give this partnership thing a try. Chapter 15, Rini. Walk him slowly, Aunt B says. We're getting Rufus used to the backyard. It's a step on the way to flying him on the creants. More slowly than this. More slowly than this? I'm barely moving. It's 6 a.m., so I'm also barely awake. She shakes her fist. Follow his cues. Right. Partners focus on each other. Rufus lifts his tail. I'm moving too fast. I roll my boots across the grass. He settles into a more upright perch. Excellent, Aunt B whispers. But I knew that before she said anything. I can do this. Third period, we're given detailed assignment sheets with our group and topic printed at the top that we will have to fill out for our project. We march down to the library to begin research on the laptops. Jamie, Jackson, and I sign out our computers and claim a round table hidden in the stacks. It's like our own private fort. I declare this table for hunting, I say, stabbing my pencil, eraser down, in the center. Jamie whips out her pencil and jams it next to mine. For hunting, Jackson pulls out his whittling pen, takes places it next to ours. Hunting. How are you guys doing, Mr. Brown says cheerily as he appears from between two shelves. I'm doing falconry, I announce. I hunt deer with my dad, Jackson offers. I'm a vegetarian, Jamie says. Mr. Brown's face curdles. Um, okay. Well, let's see. Ms. Le Esperance, es Esperance. You seem to have a focus topic, Mr. Doucet. I like your focus on deer hunting. I'm doing the rules, Jackson says. My dad's a game warden. Excellent, Mr. Brown cheers. Now, you just need a part for Miss Hendricks by the end of the period. Get researching. He claps his hands and moves on to another group. Maybe I can make the poster, Jamie suggests. I can make charts on my computer at home. Each of us has to present something, I say, pointing to the assignment sheet's bullet list of project requirements. It's just that, with hunting, all I can think of is the poor deer. Deer meat is food, Jackson says. You might not eat meat, but other people do. His scowl is the most emotional emotion I've ever seen him show. Ooh, boy. I try the trick I use with Rufus. I exude calm. I open my laptop. Let's see if Wikipedia has anything helpful. Jamie ignores me. Her eyes focus on Jackson. But hunting is different. A chicken on a farm has to go, has got to know life is short, but a wild deer? So I can hunt a chicken? Well, no, that would also be awful. Now hunting is awful? Um, I mean, maybe. Jackson's face has nodded into a snarl. He digs out his whittling and gives the wood a violent scrape. Jamie begins chewing her hair like she hasn't eaten in days. The buzz pops. Dangerous. Our group partnership is crumbling. I've seen it too many times with Graham and Mom not to know. It starts with Graham getting on Mom about something small. You can't leave pans in the sink or any normal person can keep a job at Walmart. And like a fuzz on a sweater, all it takes is a few prying pokes to start the whole thing unraveling. Twenty minutes later, Graham's slamming drawers and Mom's crying in the shower. I always just want to scream at them, Stop picking! You love each other! Start here! Maybe that's what I need to say here. Guys, I say closing the computer, so Jamie doesn't like hunting. Remember last week when you two couldn't stop fighting over whether what's-his-face with a hammer could beat the other dude with a pitchfork? Jamie snorts. You mean Thor versus Aquaman? It's Thor, Jackson said, repeating his conclusion from Friday's lunch. Jamie rolls her eyes. See, I say, maybe we should do something like that. You could debate the issue. I point to the assignment sheet that lists debate as a possible format for the project. Debate hunting, Jackson says dubious. 
Yeah, I say, Jamie could talk about what she thinks it's bad, why she thinks it's bad, and you could argue the opposite. Jamie scrolls through a site. There's a whole page here on the positive impacts of hunting. Jackson glances over at her screen. I don't see any negative impacts, so there's no debate. What about the literal negative impact on the deer, Jamie asks. It's food, Braxton barks. Jackson barks. You've already started on your debate, I say, slapping them both on the shoulders. You've had so much practice with superheroes, it'll be nothing to switch over to hunting. Jamie snorts a laugh. I guess, Jackson shrugs. I bet more of the class agrees with me. Jamie smiles. Not after my presentation. Jackson's half smile back. Want to bet? Then they both look at me. Great idea, Iron Woman, Jamie says. Jackson opens his laptop. That's why I said Rini should be the leader. Actually, I think it was my idea, Jamie said, typing something. I fill out the assignment sheet while they continue this new debate. A flower of warmth blooms inside me, tickling a smile from my lips. They worked things out. We worked things out together. They think I have great ideas. The bell rings for lunch. We close up our laptops and I follow them to the calf. I sit in the empty table with my hot chocolate, with my hot lunch, and just stir the slimy jumble of the lady said was beef stroganoff. Some boy starts to sit with me, but I tell them I'm saving seats. Saving seats. It's weird to even say the words, to be waiting for someone, someones, and know that they are going to show up. I've never felt lonely before. But you can't feel lonely if alone is your natural state. But just now, watching those boys walk away, looking at the empty seats, I felt lonely, and it felt good. Jamie and Jackson sit down. Thank you, I say. For what, Jamie says, opening her chocolate milk. She brings her lunch but buys a milk every day. For thinking I could be Iron Woman, I say. For being nice to me in general. Jamie makes this face like I'm speaking Nepalese. I thought you were the only one being ni I thought you were the one being nice to me. She sucks down her milk. Yeah, Jackson adds, he's a boy a few he's a boy a few words. What's crazy is that anyone would think anyone else for that. Yeah, Jackson adds, he's a boy a few words. What's crazy is that anyone would thank anyone else for that, Jamie goes on. Shouldn't we all just be nice to one another? Shouldn't that be the normal thing? I shrug. But it's not. She pulls out her sandwich and takes a big bite. No, it's not. Daring bubbles up into his throat. You guys could come home with me on the bus if you want. If you wanted. I mean, if that was something for the hunting project, I blurt. But Jamie and Jackson look somewhere between confused and worried. I've pushed it too far, too fast. The buzz roars. I should have listened. Friends are dangerous. That'd be cool, Jackson says. I can text my mom. Jamie says, pulling out her phone from a pocket. The buzz fizzles away as quickly as it flared up. My jaw loosens, gut unknots itself, heartbeat slows. They want to come over. It was that easy. Just make the offer. Of course, it's an easy offer to invite kids to Aunt B's house. There's no fear that Mom's crying in the bathroom, no landlord lurking looking for rent, no Phil, and I saw a box of crackers in the pantry I can offer as a snack. It's easy to invite a friend over when your home doesn't feel like it's perched on the branch that's about to snap. Jamie puts the phone back in her pocket. My mom says okay. She continues eating. Jackson digs in his bag, sandwich in his other hand, pulls out a phone, texts his mom, then says, yeah. I've got this smile so big I can barely close my mouth over the spork. Cool, I say. The three of us spend the bus ride home, coming up with supervillain nicknames for our teacher. Miss Smythe is the rock, I say. No, the ice queen, Jamie says, leaning across the aisle. The ice cube, Jackson says, for math. Ha, we all agree. Ice cube it is. When we get home, I find the crackers and fill some mason jars from the tap. It's kind of cheap, but Jamie and Jackson don't say anything. We're too busy negotiating a name for Miss Thomas, the English teacher. Something evil, I say, because she's so mean and yet pretends to be nice. She's the ice queen, Jackson says, pointing a shard of cracker at me. Two-faced, Jamie states. 
Jackson considers the proposal. The bad guy from Batman, he asks. Jamie nods, shoving a stack of crackers into her mouth. She glances at my face. I'll give you an explanatory, explanatory comic. Perfect, I say. Jamie's instructing me in comprehending. Jamie Jacksonese. That's the language they speak because they talk about comics all the time. But the name Two-Face claws its way under my skin. I have so many secrets. If I told them even one, would they be here now? So your aunt lives here with your family, Jamie asks. Your aunt's the falconer, right? My aunt, I begin. An answer is either a lie or a risk. I wait for the buzz, but no hiss rises. I live with my aunt, I say, testing the truth. My mom, she's sick. Oh, Jamie says. That's rough, Jackson says. That's super rough, Jamie adds, like he gave her the right words to use. It is, I say, and this relief, like cool water, fills me to my forehead. Jackson grabs another cracker. These are good. Jamie crunches a bite of hers. They're like healthy cookies. I wouldn't go that far, I say, checking the ingredients on the side of the box, and we all kind of laugh. I open this tiny piece of myself up to them, and they stayed. They think my crackers are good enough to be called cookies. I put the box down. Do you guys want to meet Red? They both jump out of their chairs. When Aunt B comes home, she kind of freezes when she sees the two additional kids in the yard. I wanted to show them Red, I say, for our hunting project. She drops her keys into a pocket. Then I won't take my coat off. Aunt B is a pro. She explains everything step by step to Jackson and Jamie. These buildings are called mews, which is where the birds live. This glove I'm putting on is called a gauntlet. When she brings Red out, Jamie and Jackson nearly fall over. Watching Red soar, I feel like a proud mom, as if I had anything to do with her magnificence. You want to try calling her? Aunt B asked Jamie and Jackson. Jamie nearly faints. Jackson holds out his arm. Aunt B gives him a glove and put and he, then he puts a tit then puts a tidbit on it and whistles. Red comes soaring down and even Jackson can't help but laugh and smile like a goof. Aunt B shows him how to cast Red and she glides off into the trees. Jamie regains the power of speech and asks for a turn. She too seems nearly blown over by Red's swoop to her fist. Can I show them Rufus? I can't not show him to them. Now that, not when we've seen all this, they'd be missing the most important part. Aunt B's face clouds over. Rufus, she says. Well, uh, I guess that would be all right. Thank you. I'm practically popping. I'm so excited. I put up my gauntlet and go into Rufus's mew. Hey, buddy, I whisper, trying to calm down from him. For him, Rufus's eyes crack open. I put a tidbit on my fist and whistle. He swoops down and his heart and my heart jumps and races. Every time it's as amazing as the first. As he gobbles the meat, I take a deep, calming breath before tucking his jesses into the fingers of my glove and tying on the short leash from the jesses to my glove. I walk slowly out into the sunshine. This, I say, is Rufus. Jackson and Jamie gape at his gloriousness. Aunt B nods, eyebrows raised, encouraging me to say more. He's a great horned owl, I say. He bobs his head and t lifts his ear tufts. These feathers are called plumicorns. Like unicorns, Jamie squeals? They're not magic, Jackson says. How do you know, I say defensively, smiling at my dragon bird. Where'd you get him, asks Jackson. We're rehabilitating him, I explained. Rehabilitating, Jamie asks. I tell the whole story about the chow, the Balchardi trap, the passage at Hawk, trapping Rufus by accident. My audience is entranced. He's a rehab bird, Jackson asks, but he has Jess's. Part of his rehabilitation, Aunt B says quickly. Why is she so jumpy? We're getting his wings back in shape, I added. Jackson looks confused. What is he confused about? Rufus's head turns towards the driveway. A car pulls in, sending up a cloud of dust. My mom, Jackson says. Can I pet him, Jamie asks, ignoring the waiting parent, even though it's her ride? Better not, Aunt B says. That owl's still a very wild bird. And even Red's not a pet, I add. She's just used to the attention. 
Aunt B smiles approvingly. Jamie nods, a little sulk sulky, but not angry or mean. I get it. This is this was awesome, Jackson said, handing the glove back to Aunt B. I totally see why you wanted to do falconry, Jamie adds, slipping off hers. It's pretty cool, I say, trying not to be too obvious about how much it means to me that they get it. It's like they weren't fully my friends until they also knew about this, my Rufus half. And like Rufus wasn't really fully real until I shared him, all this with them. Aunt B puts Red back in the Avery and goes to introduce herself to Jackson's mom. I hang on to Rufus while Jackson and Jamie grab their stuff from the house. I wave with my free arm as they hop into the waiting car. See you tomorrow, I shout. Bye, Rufus, Jamie replies. See you tomorrow, Rini. Jackson gives me his signature single wave. As the car pulls onto the road, Aunt B walks back to where I'm strolling with Rufus through the grass. Those are some nice kids, she says. I know, I say, feeling full up with happiness and afraid of spilling any by talking too much. Aunt B gets it. She doesn't always say anything more, just takes Red out, and I watch her soar over our heads. Rufus and I watch her soar over our heads across the brilliant blue sky and pink-tinged clouds. At school the next day, while we're putting away our laptops in the library, Jackson, Jackson sneaks up beside me. You're not training the owl for falconry, right? Rufus, I say. Well, not officially. But you're going to let him go back to the wild? Weird. Why does he care? I mean, we're friends now. There's no way he'd turn me in to, to his dad. That's the plan, I say. Jackson's face relaxes. Cool. Jamie slides her laptop into the slot. If I had an owl like that, I could keep never let him go. Jamie gets it. That but that's owls but that owl's a wild bird, Jackson says. No one owns the wild. Jamie shrugs. I'm just saying having an owl in your house is too cool. Jackson shoves his hands into his pockets. It's not about what's cool, it's about what's best for the owl. I would never do anything to hurt Rufus, I say, which is true, but there's a part of me that's with that's with Jamie. How is living with me hurting him? And why does Jackson care? I know, he says. I just it's nothing. It's weird for a second, but then Jamie whips out her phone and shows us this crazy video she found of a deer jumping on a trampoline and everything is okay again. When I get home from home after school, I'm greeted by the alien song of the phone ringing. Aunt B got a super basic cell phone that she leaves in the house for me in case of emergencies. Who even knows the number? Hello, I ask, like this is the first phone call in the history of the world. Rini? Mom? Rini, it's Mom. I arranged for phone contact. Is this time okay? Uh, it takes me a second to catch up. We've done this before. During the other times, I just have to reshuffle my brain, my life, readjust. Hey. We chat for a couple minutes. She's good, getting help. I'm happy for her. I say so. The social worker, Randy, Mom says, she's been really supportive. When I get released, I'm going to start looking at apartments. Oh, I say. We can visit again. I miss you, Reens. I miss us. I miss you too, I say. And I do. But her doing well is also the beginning of the end of my time here. I've been through this cycle enough times to know. And though I've been reminding myself, I say it every night like a prayer. But opposite. This life is temporary. It's stopped feeling temporary. This isn't Graham's junk room. This is the whole, the whole world life. It stopped feeling like something I can live without. When we hang up, I say, I love you too, and I do. But there's also this icy feeling inside, like loving her means I'm halfway out the door of this place, and I can't leave, not yet. I sit down to do homework, but my foot starts jiggling, sending many earthquakes across the kitchen table, which only causes the foot jiggling situation to get worse. By the time Aunt B comes in, I'm practically vibrating myself out of the chair. Is everything all right, she asks, face quirked as if, a question, as if questioning a bear sampling her butter straight from the fridge. My mom called, I say. Aunt B gives a nod. You okay? I shrug. She say something? 
I shake my head no. Don't get yourself worked up until you know what it is that's coming, she says, slipping on her falconer's vest. We have to feed the birds. The mention of a job helps me pull me back into myself. I'll get the mice, I say, relieved to know what to do, that there is a right thing to be done. I'll get the mice, Aunt B says. You can head right out and hook that owl onto a creance. Just the word sends shivers over my skin, and the foot jingles pack, packing. We're going to try flying him, I ask. She nods. I think you're both ready. This warm spreads through me. We are ready, I tell myself, and I can feel that it's true, because even if he doesn't fly to my fist tonight, even if every attempt is a failure, I can always just put him back on my glove. Every failure is just a step in our process. Some night, even if not tonight, Rufus will fly to me. Chapter 16, Rufus. Finally, I screech as the brown frizz opens the web of my nest. I've been hooting for food since the last drop of the sun. I told you the hooting wouldn't make them come any faster, red squawks from her nest. How do you know it didn't? I chirp back. The brown frizz may never have returned if not for my hooting. The brown frizz is your partner, red rouses, stomps on her perch. Partners always come back. I consider the brown frizz she has on her good feelings face, but her heart is not in it. She holds up her big paw and makes her tweeting noise, and I swoop down. I can hear that there's something wrong with you, I hoot to her softly, trying to keep Red from listening in. If it's about what, what I hooted yesterday, I will make more of an effort to hunt things other than roots. The brown frizz's heart becomes less jumbled in its rhythm, smooths out, and the good feeling's face deepens. Perhaps that was all she needed to hear. Not that I'm promising anything, I add. The brown frizz remains content. Maybe this is a part of our partnership arrangement. Maybe the only promise she needs is that I'll try. She puts the odious tails into my leg sparkles, and that just about gets me fluffed because truly those tails are the worst. But then she does something new. She attaches a long, thin vine to the end of the tails. Outside of my nest, she holds her fist near one of the dead trees. Hop on the perch, hatchling. Red squawks. She's perched right near an opening in her nest, spying on me. I was about to, I snap back, though I was not. This partnership thing is confusing. One moment the brown frizz wants me on her paw, the next she wants me on the perch. Once I'm on the perch, the brown frizz takes a step away from me. I glance at Red, checking if she's still spying. Of course she is. The brown frizz whistles, shakes her paw. She wants me to get back on the paw. But if I just got off the paw, is there meat? There better be meat. I flap off the perch and onto the paw, and thank the thermals there's meat for my effort. I gobble it down. The brown frizz is all a twitter, hooting and trembling like something important is happening. The gray tail appears from the furless creature's nest. She seems excited by the brown frizz's hoots. She hurries towards me in the brown fit frizz, and I see she has a small pile of delicious mice in her wing toes. Give me those mice, I command. I am the great horned owl around here. I should get first pick, certainly before the brown frizz. I attempt to lift off the paw and pellets. I'm tufts down again and swinging like a bat. That means he went to fly away to go get the mice. And because he's attached to a tether on his leg, he flies and then he <laughs> it pulls him down and then he's hanging upside down. I just cannot get enough of seeing you hanging from your talons, red twitters from inside her nest. Go stuff your beak in the sap. The brown frizz dutifully sits me back up on the paw. But now I'm fluff. I'm fluffed. I'm hungry, and Red's a bumbled-footed booby, and these tail leg tails are worse than a mid-sore cloud burst. The brown frizz tries to get me to go back onto the perch, but I'm not having it. 
There will be mice or there will be no flapping from this owl, I screech. I stomp on the paw and look everywhere but at the stinking perch, and finally the brown frizz makes her growing, her growling sigh noise and grumbles to the gray tail, who nods her head. The brown frizz takes me back to my nest, removes those terrible tormenting tails, and lifts her paw, and I fly up to my favorite spot, way high near the top of the nest. The brown frizz then holds out her paw again, whistles, and great beak, she has a whole mouse. I swoop down, crash into the paw, and gobble that mouse. Once I have it down, I notice that the brown frizz is staring at me. She is quite fascinated by me. Of course she is. Seeing as she is an ugly, furless creature, I am quite the great horned owl specimen. Yes, fine. Admire away, I hoot, stretching my ear tufts and rousing my feathers. See, she did just... Give me a whole mouse. I should give her something in return. This is another part of partnership, you dud, red screeches. She's outside now, gliding over the grass and then swooping up in onto the gray tail's paw. The gray tail feeds her a scrap of meat. The small human is trying to connect with you. Red flaps away and lands on one of the perches and turns her head basking in the twilight. So that's what partnership is, flapping from paw to perch. How is this helping me learn to hunt? The brown frizz grumbles something to me. I turn my head to pay attention. She lifts the little patches of fur that grow above her eyes. I decide to look at her the same way. Perhaps this is what red means when she chirps connect. I raise my ear tufts and then sink them down and out. Flattish, the way the brown frizz has her face furs. I stare deep into her brown eyes and the way she's staring deep into mine. It does give me a bit of a buzz in the gizzard, being this close to a big animal like a furless creature, listening to her heartbeat pound in my ears. She whispers something to me. Her breath ruffles the feathers along my beak. I don't even need to look to know she's wearing her good-feeling face. I hear it in her heart, can feel it coming off her in waves. I feel it too, I chirp back. She spreads the pink edges of her beakless maw across her cheeks in a smooth curved line, wrinkling the skin around her eyes. That means she's smiling. She spreads the pink edge of her beakless maw across her cheeks in a smooth curving line, wrinkling the skin around her eyes. I try to make my beak curve, but it's no good. Instead, I do what mother used to do to me. I knock my forehead against the brown frizz's skull and nibble the bridge of her soft nostril tube. She chirps again, rubs her forehead against my beak. The world feels as safe as when mother used to tuck me beneath her wing in the nest. This partnership is, is more than just learning about to hunt. I get that now. What red means by partnership is what I call family. The brown frizz's heartbeat is all a flutter, and she's cooing like a morning dove, and I realize my heart is pounding along with the brown frizz's pulse, just like my mother and first when we were in the nest together. I've missed my family so much. Is a great horned owl allowed to admit that? I don't think I'm supposed to feel lonely, but I do. I can't wait for night to pass so I can get in a few hoots with red at daybreak, so I can fly with the furless creatures. I wonder if I'm maybe not cut out to fly alone in the world. I think that maybe I need this partnership as much as the furless creature. It may not be what I imagined when I thought of hunting in a pack, but maybe family doesn't always look just the way, just one way. We can be a family, brown frizz, I chirp to her. She growls back softly, our hearts pounding together, and I feel it from talons to tufts, a connection, strange but strong. Chapter 17, Rini. Rufus is like a different bird this morning. I wake up Aunt B at the crack of dawn again, and we are out with him on the creance, and he flies from the post to my fist, not once, but four times. He starts getting squawky after that, so we feed him and put him back in the mews. 
We can try flying him from across the yard when you get home from school, Aunt B says, whistling for Red, who swoops down from the trees. Every time Aunt B says we're ready to move forward, she double streams. This double stream of panic and excitement burns up from my belly. You think he's ready? And a part of me knows he is. I knew giving him that pep talk last night would work. I told him that he was a good bird and more, that he was the best owl ever, and that if he didn't want to flap around on post, he didn't have to, because we were working on his schedule, and when he was ready, I knew he would fly. But this, but this other part of me is terrified that the minute I step even halfway across the yard, he'll disappear into the shadows. He's ready, Aunt B says, closing red in her Avery. It's you who needs to know that, though. It's you he's trusting. If you don't believe in him, no no way he's going to believe in himself. You really think all it takes is my believing he can fly to my fist? That sounds like a load of manure fresh from the cow. She takes off her gauntlet. Not at all, she says, but it's not nothing. Rufus chirps, sounding more like a chick than a full-grown owl. Then again, he might not even be full-grown. I keep forgetting he's just a baby bird, not even a year old. Maybe the last piece of his recovery is just believing he's recovered. The sun cre crests the trees. You'd better run if you're catching that bus, Aunt Bee says. I leg it inside and clean myself up, then grab a Pop-Tart from Aunt Bee's hand as I pass the kitchen on my way out to the bus. I look back through the bus windows towards the house, sending good thoughts to Rufus through the misty strips of sunlight, half knowing that's insane and absolutely not a real thing, but also sure that he hears me and feels loved. Jackson shows up late. I had an overnight with my dad, he says, sliding into his desk just as Mr. Miss Thompson begins shuffling papers and clearing her throat to signal the beginning of the day. His backpack is bulging. The cuff of a pair of pajamas pants dangles from where it's caught on the zipper. He literally had a sleepover with his dad. I guess that's what divorced kids have instead of visitation. Not that I've had visitation in a while. Miss Thomps Thomas blathers on about Dicey's song. It's about these kids who go to live with their grandmother because their mom is sick and they have to start over with this stranger. It's a little on the nose for my right for my life right now. I think Miss Thomas is trying to connect with me. Every few pages, she gives me these puppy dog eyes. Halfway through the period, we break into groups to talk about last night's reading. Jackson, Jamie, and I turn our desks together. Jamie has this whole theory going about the grandmother and some secret plot to keep the kids from their mom. I let her go on. It's easier to believe the grandmother is a bad guy. It's harder to know that sometimes your mom just can't be your mom anymore. I bet the mom was the one who sent that letter, Jamie says, her finger pointing at the book like she's solved the case and everything's going to be all better now. Mom's going to swoop in and take the kids back to some big house, complete with playground in the black backyard and a golden retriever on the porch. It's from the hospital, I tell her, because I've seen these those same kinds of letters in the mail. The mom's not coming. You read ahead, Jackson asks, flipping to the end of the book. I shrug. I have a feeling. I know. I'm sticking to my version, Jamie says as the bell rings. I believe mom's going to show up before the end. I jam my copy of the book down into the bottom of my backpack and zip it closed. The art, in art, the teacher, Ms. Whipple, has set out on the tables some pieces of paper and coffee cans stuffed with colored pencils. I'm going to give you the period to draw man, mandal, man, mandalas, she announces to the class after everyone's perched on the stool. There's a circle on each paper. A what? I grumble. As if answering, Miss Whipple walks over to one of the posters on the wall. This is a Tibetan Buddhist mandala. It's a cyclone of color exploding out in patterns and lines, squares inside squares with tiny figures nestled in between. It means circle and traditionally what was meant to represent the universe. I'd like you to think of it as a way of symbolically capturing your personal universe at this time. If you're looking for where to start, 
Think of it as having a center out of which the rest of the drawing sprouts, like a sunflower or a spinning galaxy. What a ridiculous project. This is exactly the kind of touchy-feely garbage that guidance counselors always give you. But whatever, I have nothing else to do. I pick up a yellow pencil. All I can think to draw is Rufus's eyes. Two big yellow circles inside the black line of the printed circle. Two black pupils at the center of each eye, then brown fanning out from these circles like scales, like the whirls of a fingertip. A sharp jag of beak between them, screaming out, red, 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 like lightning cracking through the circle. The bell rings. It's like being shaken awake. I look up from my mandala. Everyone else is already packed up. Jamie's mandala is a bullseye of pinks and yellows. Jackson drew this incredible green and purple pattern of diamonds swirling out from a sunburst of red. I look down at my picture. I've drawn a monster. Not Rufus, but some terrible, raging nightmare. Am I that nightmare? I bring the picture over to Miss Whipple. What does this mean? She looks at my drawing. I don't know, she says, handing it back to me but it seems pretty intense. The yellow eyes draw me in, the brown whirlpools around. It's so angry, I mumble. She pe peeks over the top of the paper. It's okay to be angry, she says. Anger is something everyone feels, but sometimes it doesn't feel very safe to be angry. A mandala is a safe place for you to put your anger. I want to tell her that I s tell her I said, the drawing is angry, not me, but then I stop because her words are humming inside me as if answering a call. Everything she said is true and right, but this anger feeling so much bigger than any piece of paper can hold. Oh, I say. Here, she says, holding out another page and a new box of colored pencils. Take this home. See how you're feeling tonight. I take the paper and pencils. It feels like I've been dropped out of a tree. Jamie's eyes bug out when she sees me. What happened? Your face is like, whoa. Do you think I'm angry? Now Jamie is confused. At me? No, just like in general. Jackson scrapes this long silver from sliver from his wood with his pen. I'm angry. Jamie and I both look at him like he's lying. Jackson is the calmest and least angry person in the er on earth. I am, he says. My parents had me see the school's counselor when they were getting divorced. It took me a while to get there, but I realized I was mad at them for getting divorced. You told your parents you were mad at them? J Jamie's voice is full of awe and wonder, like the concept of being mad at a parent had never occurred to her. Then again, I'm also kind of like, wait, you can be mad at your parents for getting divorced? Yeah, Jackson says, sliding the pen along the deep groove. It was hard, but afterwards my parents kind of took their their fighting someplace else. They tried to explain things to me like why they were getting a divorce and how they still love me. Jamie's jaw dangled. I peek at my mandala. I'm still angry, he says, scraping another piece, but it helped to say it. Is everybody angry, Jamie asks. Jake Jackson shrugs. Maybe. I'm not angry, Jamie says. Maybe you are and you don't know it, I say, thinking back to what she said about her grandmother being the one who should die in Dicey's song. I slip the mandala into my backpack. Maybe the whole world is actually powered by secret rage. Jamie frowns. I hope that's not true. Jackson flashes his half smile. Me too. I dare to grab both their hands. Me three. But during the whole bus ride home, all I can do is stare at the mandala. What am I so angry about? The buzz answers, alone. But I'm not alone. I have Jackson and Jamie and Aunt Bee and Rufus. And then I remember that I don't have Rufus, that he has to leave me and go back to the wild, that I don't have Aunt Bee, that Mom is doing better and soon I'll be leaving everything, though who knows what better even means as long or how long it's going to last this time. And then the guilt for even thinking such a thing is admitting, even just in my head, that mom will fall apart again. 
floods my lungs, and I'm underwater, sinking down, down, down. And by the time the bus stops at the end of my driveway, all I want to do is see Rufus. So I stumble through the yard to his Avery, where he's still snoozing, and I collapse through the entry and onto the floor among the feathers and whitewash and just start to cry. The tears come and they rain down, soaking my shirt. Chapter 18, Rufus. The brown frizz has come into my nest and appears to be suffering from some fit. She's curled in on herself like a hedgehog and shuddering. Every few heartbeats, she heaves in this huge breath like she's bobbing up from a deep dive underwater. Very odd. I shall investigate. I swoop down from my favorite high perch to my moot rock, which is the closest perch to her. You have woken me, I began. What is wrong with you? The brown frizz tips her head up and peers at me through the thicket of her head fur. The whites of her eyes are cracked with red lines. She burbles something from her beakless maw. Great beak, break. Great beak. Is the brown frizz dying? You must go and talk to the gray tail, I squawk. She is very good at fixing things. Perhaps also the small creature with the black head fur. She also seemed rather good with injuries. The brown frizz grumbled softly and curls her head back into her knees. This is more serious than I thought. It appears the brown frizz is giving in to death. Father said something about this. He had a hatchmate who broke a blood feather. The bird just couldn't recover. Has the brown frizz broken some vital part of herself? I bob my head, listen for sounds of injury, check her over for wounds. No, the brown frizz is intact. An internal injury. Mother was always going on about that. First gets off that skinny twig. You'll fall from the tree and get an internal injury. First was like that. She'd hop onto any branch, no matter how far from the nest, just to make me feel like a dud. If the brown frizz is suffering from an internal injury, to be honest, I really have no idea what that means, but mother seemed positive that it was the first flap on the flight to death. She must get help. Intervention is necessary. I adjust my feet on the perch and judge the distance, and with one brief flap and a hop, I land on her knee. Brown frizz, I screech directly at her head fur. You must be suffering from an internal injury. No need to upset her further with a clear diagnosis. You must, I repeat, you must go and get help. The brown frizz again tips her head up and sneaks a glance at me through her fur. Seriously, I squawk. Pick up your little tailless bottom and get help. The brown frizz lifts her head and I see that her eyes have leaked all over her hairless cheeks. The skin around the, her eyes is pinkish and the eyes themselves show red like pulsing through cracks in their whites. What strange and wondrous eyes these furless creatures have. Most bizarre is the fact that she's wearing her good feeling face. The brown frizz grumbles something and rubs the feathers on my foot with her little winged toes. That tickles, I twitter, and nibble her winged toes with my beak. The brown frizz grumbles again and the good feelings face spreads all the way to her eyes. Perhaps the furless creature does not have an internal injury. Perhaps she is just seriously fluffed. The brown frizz tickles my foot feathers again and I nibble at her and she chortles like this is the most wonderful thing. She certainly doesn't seem mid-flight to death. The brown frizz lifts her little paw and runs her winged toes down my fur chest. I rouse at her touch. No one since mother has groomed my feathers. But then again, the brown frizz wants to be family. Maybe this is part of the ritual. All right, brown frizz, I chirp. You may preen my feathers, but do be careful about the alignment of the barbs. I, I'm rather particular about my barbs. The brown frizz continues to run her silly winged toes over my feathers and coos softly. Clearly, she is no longer suffering from whatever had previously ailed her, meaning she had certainly only gotten herself seriously fluffed. Furless creatures do have a dramatic way of getting fluffed, what with the leaking eyes and the shuddering and the gasping like a fish dropping in the forest. Hey, Red, I squawk loudly. Look at this. 
I think the brown frizz and I have achieved this partnership you keep screeching about. Red flaps to the opening in the wall of her nest and looks into mine. She stares down her beak at us, weighing us like prey. It certainly is an improvement. She glances at the yard and the human nest. You still can't hunt, though. She had to bring that up. But you said the brown frizz will teach me, I squawk back. That's the whole partnership thing. Red turns her yellow eyes back onto me. One kill at a time, hatchling. The brown frizz slides her naked winged toes into her big paw, and I hop from her knee onto the paw, which is clearly her favorite way for me to perch, the way that gets me the most mouse bits per visit. On that thought, where is the mouse, I squawk, because I haven't eaten since sunup and things are getting growly in the gizzard. The brown frizz clearly understands owlish because she walks directly towards the human nest, begins barking loudly, and then the gray tail comes out bearing a pile of mice. More owls should look into this partnership business, I think, gobbling down the first scraps she offers. And then I think of first and all her showing off and teasing, and it's clear that certain owls would not make much of a partner for these poor furless creatures. First would have torn the, the head fur right off the brown frizz, seeing her so vulnerable and fluffed earlier. No, it is truly only the absolute worst owls in all of owldom who are fit partners for furless creatures, because only the absolute worst owls in all of owldom would be desperate enough to discover how nice it is to have a thing like a partner. Only the absolute worst owls would fall so low as to uncover the treasure of friendship. When the brow, brown frizz puts me on the post and whistles, I fly, silent and strong, barely riffling the blades of grass, and land on her paw. Her face is brighter than the moon on a clear night. <laughs>